Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. So let's get started. And thank you for joining us today to talk about one of your favorite topics, end-to-end -end testing. And today, we are going to talk about how you can use the end-to-end -end framework to build confidence in your Kubernetes controllers and clusters. My name is Matteo Ruina. I'm a senior software engineer at Datadog, a cloud observability company. And I work in the control plane team where we manage uh, the Kubernetes control plane for our users. Today, I'm presenting with Philippe. I'm Philippe Scorsolini. I work at Abbound and a cross-plane maintainer. Cool. So the agenda for today is to give you an overview about what uh, is the end-to-end -end framework and why we have it, and then to give you an overview about how we do end-to-end -end testing at Datadog and cross-plane. So the first step is to talk about the end-to-end -end framework. It's a Go framework to do end-to-end -end tests of components running in Kubernetes clusters. And why do we have that? You can say, hey, if I go inside the Kubernetes repository, there is already an extensive set of example and code to do end-to-end -end tests. The problem with the framework is that it's tightly coupled with Kubernetes itself. It's designed to test Kubernetes and to ensure a consistent and reliable behavior of the Kubernetes code base. It is not designed to be used outside as external library. Plus, it's based on Ginkgo. Ginkgo is a testing framework with Forgo that has its own DLS. And uh, it's something that uh, uh, is similar to a behavior-driven development uh, framework. So it has uh, its own set uh, of instruction and its own way to declare the test that is quite different from what you're used when you're writing Go tests. And so now we have the end -end framework that is an official uh, SIG project with the goal to provide a documented approach for end-to-end -end testing, an official tool that you can use. Uh, as close as possible uh, to use uh, uh, the Go test the package that you use every day with components to help you to build your test suite, helper functions to uh, get you started when interacting with Kubernetes clusters, and especially avoiding all the dependencies on the Kubernetes code base itself. Let's have a look about how the end-to-end -end framework works. So at the heart of the framework, there is the environment object. It has a config that is used to store your test suite configuration. You can customize the configuration with your own CLI flags. And then there is a context that you can use to pass signaling and data uh, across each phase of the tests. You can use functions to customize the different stages of the environment, including environment setup, before a test, after a test, or when tearing down the environment. Then you have your regular Go tests that are made by one or multiple test feature. A feature is a collection of steps that can be executed as a group, where a step is a granular operation that you can combine to perform the actions that you want. And the steps that you can apply to your test are setup, assess, and teardown. Now I know this is a lot, so let's have a look at some code example. Here you can see that I'm creating a, a new environment in the test main. I'm applying an environment function, in this case, the setup. You can add any code that you want to be executed before any of your tests there. And then I'm running the test suite. Then I have a regular Go test, in this case, the Hello World, where I have a new feature. You can apply a name to the feature. You can add labels. And then I'm adding the steps that I want for the test. In this case, there is a setup, a single assessment, and a teardown. Of course, you can have multiple setup phase, uh, steps, multiple assess, and multiple teardown. And then at the end, you execute the test feature. Now that uh, you got your 101 on the end-to-end -end framework, let's discuss about how we are using it at Datadog. The first question is, uh, why do we even bother about doing end-to-end -end tests? And the reason is that at Datadog, we have a Kubernetes setup with hundreds of clusters, thousands of nodes, and we run across multiple cloud providers. Also, to have the same layer of abstraction and consistency, we run our own Kubernetes software. And on top of Kubernetes, we install all our internal controllers. There is not only my team, but multiple teams managing all those clusters, making multiple changes per day. So at the end of the day, how do you make sure that everything is working as expected? 
And so we are using the end-to-end -end framework to build our own internal conformance test suite. For example, is the DNS working as expected? Not only can I resolve internal or external domain, but can I do cross-cluster or cross data center DNS resolution? Uh, can I provide capacity to the workloads? We have a bunch of internal controllers that we use to manage the node lifecycle. Are they working as expected? So can I decommission nodes without causing disruption? We test the clusters daily. We have a cron job that runs the full test suite in every cluster every day. At the moment, we are a little more than 40 tests. It takes between 30 and 30 minutes to run the whole test suite, depending how busy the cluster is. And so we get a signal if we are breaking something. We also use it when we spin up a new cluster. So uh, we provision a cluster, and then we run the first uh, set of tests to make sure that we have the Kubernetes primitives that we need. And then we install all the Datadog customization and internal controllers on top of it. And then we run again the full test suite. When everything is passing, we can onboard the new users and we tell them, hey, the cluster is ready, now you can deploy. Another usage of our test is when we update a single component. So imagine that you have a controller, we have Helm charts, you are bumping the controller versions, you are making a change to the chart, I don't know, your RBAC. And so when you install it, we also run a small subset of the test related to that particular controller to make sure that you are not breaking anything. What was our journey for testing? So like many, <laughs> we started importing the entry Kubernetes and end framework, but like many, we got into all the problems that I was discussing at the beginning. You know that Kubernetes uh, as a repository is not designed to be easily imported. You need to do some sort of ACA. It's very heavy, let's say. And so uh, when you need to update it, you need to be careful. And not everyone was uh, used to the Ginkgo way of doing tests. So when we saw the end-to-end -end framework, we did the POC, we wrote a proposal, everyone was on board with that. And uh, we liked that it's an official SIG project that is designed from the ground up to test on Kubernetes, that it has already a lot of helper functions to interact with the clusters, and that provides also enough components uh, to create your own test suite, but uh, is very close or try to be as close as possible our pure, pure Go testing. So how did we do the migration? So at the beginning, we wanted to try to use uh, uh, the same uh, Go module, but uh, we tried using Go workspace. We couldn't figure it out and didn't work for us. So what we ended up doing was creating a subdirectory inside the old Ginkgo test with the end-to-end -end framework, and then slowly migrating one test at a time. Every time we needed to add uh, shared code, we were creating like uh, an external library uh, to share the code between the two frameworks. And then we migrated all the tests like that. And at the time of building, in the same Docker file, we build both binaries. And when we run our test, we have the two containers. So we run Ginkgo test with their own flags and the end-to-end -end frameworks with its own flags. When we did this migration, we also asked ourselves if there is anything that we want to change about the way we structure our end-to-end -end test. And so we took the opportunity to reflect on how we write tests. So first of all, now we write Kubernetes object and not YAML. Uh, I know we are all YAML engineers. We love YAMLs. But the problem is when you have 50 YAML files for all your tests, it's very difficult when you want to make a change. Imagine that you want to ensure label consistency for cost tracking or for compliance. Or you need to bump a new version on the base container. Now that we have a shared library, uh, we have a single place where we can make this change and we can ensure that our users are uh, um, importing just that library. Previously, a lot of people were also copy and paste a lot of YAMLs to get started. Now they can just instantiate a new object. We also create additional helpers functions. As I was mentioning, we have a bunch of internal controllers, so we also need additional helpers to make sure that our objects are ready. And then we extend uh, easily the end-to-end -end framework. For example, we have a bunch of CLIs that we need to pass uh, when we run the environment. And so we wrap uh, the end-to-end -end environment inside our own. 
uh, we do validation, uh, we need to make sure that when we start uh, the test suite, uh, we run uh, the test for a specific cloud provider, only on that very cloud provider and not on the others, and we can do that uh, uh, passing our own CI flags. We also tell our developers, uh, please assume that all your tests are going to be run in parallel, and so we provide two other gu guidelines. First one is only one feature per test, as I was saying at the beginning, you can add multiple features to your test, but if you do that, even if you enable parallel testing, the features are going to go one at a time. And then we also run a test in its own namespace. This helps us avoiding pollution when we do the test, and uh, it's easy when you do the cleanup. If you go on GitHub uh, at that URL, you can find an example repository with a Docker file, an example of a library, uh, there are a couple of uh, objects uh, uh, to wrap the environment, uh, and uh, so that is a possible approach to use the end-to-end -end test and should help you getting started in adopting it. Of course, I work at Datadog, so it would be awkward if I didn't have any slide about observability. And so uh, every time we run a test, result, a test, we also send metrics about the test result. Uh, in this case, we can build a dashboard and alerting when some tests are failing. We also have our Datadog agent scraping the pod for logs, so when a test is failing, we can easily see why it's not working. And we recently integrated with our CI visibility product. If you run your Go test, you can also export the test result as a JUnit file, and when you upload it, you can see uh, all nice of graphs and statistics about your test. In this example, you see uh, a test that we are actually running, uh, that is running a bunch of times, uh, it's failing once, uh, and then you can drill down uh, why it's failing, is it a specific cluster, which cluster, and then if you start seeing uh, more and more failing, uh, you get alerted because the test becomes flaky, and then you can slice it and say, oh yeah, is this by environment or a cloud provider, is the whole test suite, is it a particular test? And if you're interested around the performance, you can also go and see how long usually does it take to run your test. And then you can spot uh, regressions or outliers, and you can go and, and make sure that uh, nothing is broken. So overall, I would say that we are pretty happy about uh, the end-to-end -end framework. The feedback that I get from my fellow developers uh, is pretty positive. It's easy to use. It's very easy to get started. It's just like importing a regular and other regular package without any magic uh, into your project. Uh, it has a lot of helper functions out of the box. Uh, you can easily extend uh, almost all the components, and it feels very close to write uh, the code test that you're already used to. Of course, the project is not perfect uh, yet, uh, still quite young. Parallel testing is not there yet. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the slide, uh, there is uh, this global config in the environment. And so when you enable at the moment a parallel test, uh, multiple guru teams try to write to the config causing a rest condition. Hopefully we are going to have a PR to fix it in the next few weeks. Um, there is also additional flags that you can pass to the framework to run tests in parallel. So you can use uh, the regular T parallel as a Go test, or you can pass the parallel flag in the framework that is going to spawn subroutines to create your test. I don't think this provides a very good user experience, so we rely on the Go T parallel to run the tests. Um, and uh, I think that is annoying if you submit the metrics is that you can't detect if a test is run or skip. So we end up looking at the metrics and see a bunch of green, uh, and all the tests are taking zero seconds. is because the test uh, is actually not running. Uh, and we have an open issue for that, but we don't have a PR yet. So this is our experience at Datadog, and now I'm going to leave the stage to Philippe to talk about how they're doing at Crossplane. Yeah, thank you, Matteo. So let's talk about uh, the end -to -end, how we run end-to-end -end tests at Crossplane 2. Uh, as you'll see, we have a pretty different approach in some aspects uh, with respect to what Matteo just showed, uh, mostly due to the different context and the different uh, scope for, uh, for our end-to-end -end tests. But first, uh, let's, let's quickly introduce Crossplane. Uh, the sales pitch describes it as a framework for building cloud-native control planes, but you can see it as three things, an ecosystem of providers to manage external APIs, such as cloud providers, but 
also whatever has an, an API actually. Uh, look up provider pizza if you want to check uh, how to order a pizza using Crossplane. And, but uh, also a low-code framework to compose these resources into your custom APIs and then a package manager to handle all the above. This translates into this, which as you can see, it's pretty complex. Uh, and this is obviously not even the whole thing. So we really need good co testing coverage in order to have confidence shipping new features uh, and uh, refactoring all code or fixing bugs. We already had uh, and still have today some good uh, unit test coverage, almost uh, 70 per more than 70% on CoreLogic, uh, but this heavily rely on mocking, uh, which is fine, but obviously means that uh, even if CI is green, at the end of the day, maybe uh, uh, when, when you, once you get uh, to, the deployment, to the actual deployment, uh, stuff can, can still be broken. Uh, we had a dedicated repo for end-to-end -end tests uh, with a small number of, uh, of scenarios that we run on a schedule on the latest uh, uh, commit on, on, main, on the main branch uh, to be sure stuff was at least uh, not completely broken. These were uh, playing Go tests using just client Go, but we were lacking the confidence I was talking about previously. So we agreed this was not enough and uh, uh, we decided to move the end-to-end -end tests back into the uh, crossplane repository and add a, a few new scenarios so that we could run them on each, uh, on each PR. But we had to pick something to do that. And so what do we actually care about when writing end-to-end -end tests? How are these scenarios actually run? Go testing, some custom tool, uh, how much control do we have? we need to spin up and down stuff. So like a kind cluster or uh, the cross-plane hand chart uh, with maybe some custom values, any additional components, uh, how to define those scenarios, uh, the language you use, the fixtures, uh, does it provide any helpers to deal with eventually consistent uh, uh, Kubernetes resources? And so, as you can see, uh, we considered a few options uh, from the most classical ones, uh, Ginkgo and Gomega, uh, which we actually already used in the past in, uh, in Crossplane and we removed from Crossplane uh, a while ago, to more exotic ones like uh, Gherkin flavored uh, uh, tests. Here I tried to highlight uh, all the aspects uh, we were talking about previously. So uh, the engine, so how tests will be run uh, with each option. And as you can see, Cato uh, is the only custom one. The rest will still run on Go testing in w one way or another. Helpers, uh, whether uh, they provided ways to set up the environment, uh, handle Kubernetes resources, and deal with uh, eventual consistency. And as you can see, we have different degrees of, uh, uh, of degrees there. And then the front end. How test, uh, how test scenarios will be actually defined. Some are more heavyweight frameworks uh, and have their own DSLs uh, or let you define your own DSLs directly, while other can be just used uh, as regular tests. Crossplane, as you might know, is written in Go, so we decided uh, to write our own tests in the same language and if possible, stick as much uh, to the usual Go testing we, we already used for the rest of the code base. So, as you can see, the only option checking all the boxes for us was the E2E framework. It's handled by SIG testing, so it felt as, as the right choice, as Matteo was saying. There's a rich set of helpers. Uh, you can handle kind clusters uh, directly from your code. Uh, no need for any hacky uh, bash scripts to spin up your, uh, your kind cluster. You can handle fixtures uh, both through YAML manifests and, or directly as Ghostructs. And you can interact with Helm charts, installing, upgrading, and uninstalling uh, them as needed. It adds little cognitive overload uh, on top of the Go testing framework, uh, so at least uh, not as much as he other heavyweight frameworks. Uh, and uh, you can see a dedicated one pager with more details if you're interested. So we defined our gu guidelines. Uh, we decided to have one feature per test. Uh, uh, so that we can directly select tests to run using standard Go test selectors. Uh, uh, all tests must be self-contained, ensuring Crossplane itself is installed as needed, restoring the previous state and deleting everything they created, and uh, fail otherwise. We don't run tests in parallel, in, in parallel differently from uh, what Matteo was saying, at least for now. Uh, as most crossplane resources are cluster scoped, so for us it was really hard to implement parallel tests. 
Um, so each test can assume it has the whole cluster available as long as it's able to clean it, clean it up after, after the test. Uh, we should be, um, we should, uh, be able to run these tests against an existing installation too, so, uh, so as a sort of conformance test to check uh, something is behaving as a good cross-plane uh, installation. And uh, we decided also, differently from the Datadog case, to use YAML manifests. This is mostly because we are an open source project, so having some automatically tested, tested uh, manifests uh, that you can reference people to is actually a good thing for us, uh, although the cut and paste and handling and all the things about YAML, uh, that's actually obviously an issue, but for us it was the pros were, were more than the cons. And we keep them up to date uh, by using Renovate to uh, bump all the images around all the, our manifests. Um, we, uh, we, used, uh, some, we built uh, and we suggest using some uh, um, dummy cross-plane packages like uh, function dummy or provider nop so that we don't have to spin up actually infrastructure out in the cloud using provider AWS or other providers. And uh, uh, if needed, uh, use and uh, enrich when, when applicable our library of helpers uh, that, we uh, that we'll see in a moment. Uh, you can see our complete guidelines for more details there. So we also extended uh, the, the environment uh, to add a few custom flags, mostly to handle kind uh, and uh, uh, how to set up its, uh, the cluster and how to handle failures and what to do on failures. Then we also introduced uh, an additional concept of test suites, uh, which we'll talk more about in the next slides. And finally, from the test main, you can see it's just a matter of adding all a, a, a list of setup steps, a list of finish steps, and then run the whole thing. As I was saying, most, uh, most cross-plane resources are cluster scoped, and some tests require a specific configuration, like some alpha feature enabled, uh, or some additional external component will be running during the test. So we introduced the concept of test suites to bundle up those things together. So both the custom setup and the tests uh, that expect that, uh, that um, setup. Then in CI, in CI, as you can see there, we use GitHub Actions. We run them in parallel based on the test suite. So we have a, uh, a base one and then more or less one for each alpha feature. Uh, on failures, we want the single ones to, uh, to stop so that we can collect all the required information to debug them. As I was saying, everything is cluster scoped, so it's hard to run to be sure next uh, uh, tests are going to run successfully if a previous test is fa failed. At the moment, it's not an issue because we actually have uh, some pretty short times on the end-to-end -end tests, but if it's going to become an issue, we're going to address that in some other, in some other way. Um, however, we uh, still let other uh, uh, test suites finish to run so that we can at least understand whether there is an issue with uh, some, we broke, whether we broke everything or we just uh, uh, broke uh, some particular configuration. Uh, to, un to understand what went wrong on failure, we build a graph of all the resources in the cluster and uh, dump uh, and print down the whole, uh, um, all, the related all the related resources uh, to the one we are actually testing at the moment uh, with all the events. And if that's not enough, uh, we also uh, zip and upload the whole, uh, um, uh, the whole cluster logs uh, with full audit logs enabled and then we can, we can debug it further. Test suites can, uh, uh, can include each other and tests can be part of multiple test suites. As you can see here, we have a base one uh, that most of our test suites include, uh, but we also split the life cycle scenarios like uninstalling an and upgrading cross-plane from the latest stable release to their own test suite so that we can include just that uh, from suites that uh, uh, we know don't uh, actually affect uh, uh, core functionalities. This way, when promoting a feature to, to beta, uh, which means it's going to be enabled by default, we are sure we are not going to break any core functionality and we just need to merge all, all those tests into the base one. So let's see an example of an actual uh, test. 
Uh, this is a, a pretty basic one. We just want to check cross planes composition engine works as expected, uh, and that we are able to propagate some field down to compose the resources and back to the composite resource. So we have our dedicated manifest uh, folder, uh, as you can see there, uh, usually containing a setup subfolder with uh, a bunch of uh, and a bunch of other manifests. Um, and then uh, um, we define our features. Um, we, we define our feature, usually one per test, as we said. And we set some useful labels so that we can slice and dice uh, the tests as needed. And also we declare one or more subtests, uh, uh, one or more suites uh, the tests belong to. Um, then we define our setup steps, uh, applying all the setup manifests and checking that everything is running accordingly uh, as, we, as we need it to. And then we define a few assessment steps. steps. We try to keep it clean and separate different steps uh, so that we can easily see uh, what step fail later. In this case, we apply our claim, wait for it to be ready, and then check it, uh, uh, it has the field we expect uh, uh, properly set. And then we define our tear down steps, cleaning up everything and, uh, um, uh, so that the cluster is ready for the next test. There is definitely room for improvement. On our side, for example, uh, right now we lack the statistics about test uh, flakiness, which uh, uh, Matteo showed earlier, so we should definitely get some credits from Datadog for that. Uh, it's mostly left uh, to us maintainers to know uh, which tests are known to be flaky and uh, uh, their expected uh, success rate, so that we can at least know we, if we rerun that uh, a few times and everything works fine, it's the known thing we, we already handled and we have an issue for. And then usually we push at the end of the release cycle to stabilize the whole thing and uh, uh, possibly fix some bug. But actually, which is obviously not the best approach, so that's definitely something we should improve on our, ourselves. Most of the times, uh, actually, these, are due, these failures, are due, these flakiness uh, uh, issues are, are due to as I was saying, to hanging resources by over resources left hanging by over tests. So we could actually um, improve on that with some smart workaround by namespacing stuff, or uh, we should work on that probably. This could also potentially allow us to run the whole thing in parallel. So the same, uh, the same solution would actually uh, bring us to uh, win two times. Uh, then uh, Go120 introduced coverage for integration tests too, so you can export uh, uh, integration tests uh, coverage for uh, your binary running, uh, so for your, your, your test uh, binary running somewhere, and uh, you can actually see what part of the code base you are testing and you're, you're actually running, and we should definitely use that to see which parts we are not, we are not testing that much and we, can, and we can improve on that. On the E2E framework side, our main complaint right now is that the setup and teardown steps, although they can be given a name, they are actually ignored completely at the moment. And uh, uh, similar, similarly to assessment steps, uh, they, they don't run as, uh, um, as subtests. Uh, I have a long standing issue uh, created uh, on the E2E framework uh, repository, but I still, unfortunately, I still have to find uh, the time to work on that. Uh, but other than that, uh, we are pretty happy, and uh, uh, it's been a nice uh, experience. And that's it. So thank you for coming, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to. So the question is if there is any performance issue with this setup in their case, or? So for us, um, it was a matter more of uh, readability and the maintenance of the role of the framework. 
uh, we were living um, our Ginkgo. Uh, so the end-to-end -end framework that we had was based on Kubernetes. And so at that point, you need to decide if you update your end-to-end -end test independently. So every time they do a minor release in Kubernetes, you bump it. And how if it needs to be in sync with your own Kubernetes version. Um, and so for us, it was more like uh, uh, people were finding it difficult to write in testing Ginkgo. And the whole managing of the cluster was quite complicated. Uh, of, the, of the dependency was quite complicated. But I don't think that we see a lot of performance. I think that we are going to see them as soon as we can go back to parallel, uh, because at the moment is not there. Yeah, in our case, the performance is not really an issue yet. Uh, all test suites run in around, depending on which one, between 10 and 20 minutes. Uh, so that's fine. Obviously, spinning up and down every time stuff uh, is a, a waste of time. And uh, we took that approach right now because it's not a big issue, but it's definitely the first uh, item in the to-do list uh, once we add more test cases and everything becomes a little bit more slower. Uh, so the next question, um, sometimes the setup sec section of those tests can be complex and long. Installing multiple Helm charts, maybe even deploying some clusters, yeah? How do you make sure that actually setup is, is, uh, is working? And it's exactly the environment that you want and the test is not failing because the test is it's, it's, it's a, it's a wrong test. It's because setup failed. In our case, we usually add a check, uh, an assessment uh, checking that everything we installed in the setup phase is actually properly configured. Everything we care, obviously, you cannot check everything. Yeah, we do the same. So imagine that we want to make sure that a deployment, I don't know, goes on certain nodes in the setup. Maybe we, we created the deployment and we make sure the deployment gets ready. And then we move uh, to the assessment when we do specific assessment of things. But if you don't have a deployment, the whole test is already failing. Thank you. Hi. So if I got your beginning assessment properly, you could not use the test from Kubernetes itself. So did you think of doing the opposite, like using the end-to-end -end framework from the external repo into Kubernetes so that you reduce the duplication at some point? So I think that uh, when those people at Crossplane were assessing which framework, uh, there was comments also from people, people maintaining the end-to-end -end framework in tree. And I don't think there is a plan at the moment to replace Ginkgo. Also, I think they went through a major refactor to move in from Ginkgo v1 to Ginkgo v2 in Kubernetes in 3 itself. So I don't, see, I, don't see, I don't see this happening anytime soon. But I am also not involved in any of these projects, so I may be wrong. I don't know if you know more. Mm, yeah, no. Nothing more to add. Thank you. Hi, thanks. That was great. I have two questions. Um, one for Matteo. You, you mentioned that you usually run a pod that runs the test alongside the service itself in the same namespace, maybe, or a different one. Do you do that in production continuously as well? Yes. So all the cron jobs that you see in the slide, they run on the real production clusters. And so this is why sometimes we have the test. They're not flaky, but they might fail because the cluster is particularly busy at the time. And also the time that it takes to run the test can increase, especially when you do auto scaling, where you have a real workload running. But give us the best uh, signal to see if the cluster is working. We also spin up and tear down uh, end to end the cluster every day with no workload to make sure that all the controllers and the provisioning tool is still working. And I assume you, thank you. I, I assume you also run those tests in short-lived environments in CI, like maybe in kind or that sort of cluster, or maybe in the cross-plane case. Well, one issue we struggle with with that is that usually a controller depends on another controller, which depends on another controller, which depends on another controller. So it's very hard to test a single controller. We always end up testing five controllers indirectly. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I mean, that's end-to-end -end test. So we, are, we mostly focus on something high level and hope that everything down there doesn't work. And then if 
if something breaks, it's up to the unit test to catch, to catch that particular part of the code base. But yes, debugging the issue, failures is the main issue there. Going through the whole log uh, of the whole cluster is not uh, a pleasant experience. <laughs> Uh, for us, the testing in CI is quite complicated because uh, um, we do a lot of customization of the, of the clusters uh, to have a, a data log of Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and that is something that at the CI time is quite complicated. Uh, we have one controller where I'm testing uh, the end-to-end -end framework to test the controller because traditionally, if you go to the Kube Builder, for example, repository and you look for examples, it's always tested with Ginkgo. Um, so the majority of the controllers that we have are still with Ginkgo, but hopefully now that we have the end-to-end -end framework and the nice package of shared resource uh, to import, uh, we can extend also to uh, controllers testing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.